Old Path Ministries and our study through the Gospel of John. We make it to chapter 10 today, and uh, why don't you go ahead and turn there if you haven't already done so. If you've been following along every week, you know right where we're going to be. Um, before we look at the text, there are chapters, of course, that we know, and even maybe verses that we're very familiar with. And this, what we're going to look at today, the study that we have today in front of us, we won't take the whole chapter, but we're going to just deal with what Jesus was saying. We may be able to recite passages. Uh, we may even know pretty much the, what, what the topic of a particular chapter may be. This is definitely one of those because if you've been following along or if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you'll know that there are uh, seven I am statements that he makes where he says, I am the... So we've already studied two of them, uh, found in chapter 6, that he's the bread of life, chapter 8, that he says he's the light of the world. And really, from chapter 8 to here, we know that there is a, there's a direct relation between chapters 8 and 9 and 10, because um, Jesus speaks about being the light of the world, and if a person knows him, they won't walk around in darkness, but they'll have the light of life. So we get that. Well, what happens shortly thereafter? Jesus heals a man of blindness. Okay, great. So we have a literal, physical manifestation of what he was already teaching as a spiritual truth. By chapter 9, there's an interrogation of this man that has been healed by Jesus. And they're looking to, once again, they're trying to destroy Jesus because he's done this miraculous thing, but he did so, and their accusation is that he did so on the Sabbath. It's a repeating problem that happens. But look at the very last verse of chapter uh, 9, in verse 41. Jesus said, he's speaking to the Pharisees, If you were blind, then you would have no sin. He's speaking in the spiritual sense. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. So his point is, Spiritually speaking, if, if there's an ignorance in you that you don't know these things, once they are then known to you, then you can no longer plead ignorance or blindness. Now your eyes are open. So he's using their words against them. He's, they're basically accusing him. You're born of fornication. You're of the devil. You're a, you know all this nonsense. You have a demon, all these crazy things that he has said or that they have said about him here. He is able to say, all right, well, you guys say that you're informed and that you really understand all these things. So I'm telling you that you then it, by your own words, you no longer have an excuse. So remember that the imagery that's being used here is spiritual versus physical. Chapter 8, he's talking about a spiritual awakening, opening of the eyes and the lights come on. Okay, he's the light of the world. Then he gives them a real world um uh, demonstration that a person can be healed of blindness physically. In the spiritual sense, any believer has been healed of spiritual blindness. And so that is really the upshot of chapter 9. They're wanting to get into the details behind the physical healing. Jesus once again turns it to uh, very much the spiritual sense of things. So that sets the context for chapter 10 because there's no break in in the, the discussion that's going on. It goes directly into it. So, <clears throat> when we're reading the Bible, it's really good for us to be able to look whenever we're looking at, say, wherever we're picking up. Okay, so here, chapter 10. Has there been a break in the context, a break in, say, the location, or a break because there's a, a, a length of time between those things? The only break that we have from chapter 8 to where we are here in 9 was an interval of time after Jesus healed the man. He went and, and washed in the pool of Siloam, and then Jesus meets up with him again, and this person comes to believe in him. And so he walks away from that whole encounter, being a person who, as we read the, the back and forth that went on, a person who says, well, look, here's what I know when he's being interrogated. He, I can only boil it down to this. My paraphrase, I woke up this morning blind, now I see. However you guys want to try to figure out how that worked, that's on you. Jesus meets up with him a little bit later and says, do you believe in the Son of God? And so this is a way of understanding that, that there is a prophet who would be coming because he understands the imagery that Jesus is speaking about. And then, of course, the man says, well, show me who he is and I will. 
And Jesus says, well, the person that you're seeing and talking to you right now is him. And so it says this man worshipped him. Well, that got the ire of the, the Pharisees that were looking on, and they became deeply troubled about the whole thing. Great. So here we have in chapter 10 a continuation of that whole back and forth. Jesus says to them that you guys have no excuse any longer. You claim that you have knowledge. Okay, great. Jesus holds them accountable. You say that you have knowledge then fine, then you can no longer plead ignorance. Your eyes are wide open according to your own statement. Now, he then goes directly into this next part. Here's some, again, the, the I am statements are a great way for us if we're going to be doing apologetics. If we're going to be talking to people about the Bible, and again, especially about the person of Jesus Christ, we will talk to people all the time. And there are even those within the church who have this this faulty notion that God never speaks in absolutes, that the Bible is not written in absolutes, they will make the excuses that it's what it's known as deconstructionism in the in the uh, the sense of you know the modern church. And I, when I say the modern church, I'm talking about the emergent types, the people who are changing doctrine and theology away from biblical. So they will say. For instance, if you're looking at any of Paul's, um, uh, any of his epistles, we don't know who the people in that particular church were, say Philippi or Colossae or any of those. We don't know the dynamics of that church. We don't know any of the people. We don't know for sure that the details behind Paul's writing. We don't know any of those kind of things. So there's no way that we can take what Paul says to them and make some absolute statements regarding it because we weren't there, we don't know, we don't have that knowledge. Again, it's just a it's a lazy man's way of saying, I don't want to believe what's being said there because probably it just holds them accountable for things. But again, it's the lazy man's way out of having to come to grips with what's in the scripture. What you notice here, Jesus speaks in total absolutes. There is no other way around this. Now, we're going to get two of the I am statements here in chapter 10, and they are, they are absolutely 100% related to one another. The opening verses of this chapter is Jesus giving an illustration. We'll get John's commentary saying they didn't understand, and then Jesus is going to give them basically the interpretation of what was this, this real-world explanation of his relationship to the flock. So for those people that would ever want to say, and really make note of this, you guys, as you're, as you're hearing this, make sure that you make note of this, and you can do so with all of the I am statements, whether it says, I'm the bread of life, chapter 6, whether he's the light of the world, chapter 8, here in chapter 10, that he's the door and that he's also the, the uh, good shepherd, uh, or the next chapter when we get to he is the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life in chapter 14, chapter 15, I am the vine. In all of those, he makes himself as the singular. No one else could possibly make the claims to those, those statements. So the statements stand on their own, but then his explanation of how that works and what we understand of the spiritual interpretation of it, massively important that we fully understand that. So these direct absolute statements. Chapter 10 is immediately on the heels of chapter 9 in context. It doesn't break from chapter 9 to chapter 10. It is just that Jesus is continuing to, to make them understand the imagery that is behind his words. So with all of that said, hopefully that is helpful. We want to make sure that we are at all times able to say the Bible speaks in absolute terms. And if it didn't, then what you would have is a direct argument against this chapter because people at that point could say, since we don't know absolutely, then there's no reason for us to be able to say there's no way to heaven except through Jesus or except through his sacrifice or, and then, you know, fill in the blanks. Then anybody has license to change the actual intent behind his words. So I hope we understand how important that is. Okay, so chapter 10. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we come to your word, we desire that you open our eyes to these truths, that we fully understand them. And Lord, we may very well be able to, to recite and, and to quote that, that uh, Jesus is the good shepherd and that he is the doorway to the sheep. We understand all of those things, but may we understand it fully in context, especially 
that we would be able to settle it in our own hearts, that you might be able to use us in this world as we, as we reveal to a world who doesn't know him who the person of Jesus is and the things that he had said and why it's so important. So we give you all thanks, and we ask that you would guide our study today in your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. All right, so chapter 10 begins this way, most assuredly. So that's his way of saying, let me give you ironclad, most assuredly, like pay attention. What I'm about to say is, is you know, monumentally important. But notice that there's, again, no break. Let's read verse 41 of chapter 9 again. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but you say, we see, so therefore, Jesus says, your sin remains. Notice immediately, chapter 10, most assuredly, I say to you that he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So the people that he is speaking to, once again, this is strictly for accountability. He's not looking to win an argument here with these people, but this is being said around the multitudes. So not only are there the Pharisees with who he is contending, but remember, there's always an audience with this. So this is for whoever hears these words, they are able to put these pieces together. A person that says that they understand in the spiritual sense they themselves are their own words condemn them basically because he says okay well if you guys say that you understand all this stuff then you're accountable you're no longer walking around in blindness though they are his way of saying well but you've heard the things that i've said now if you reject them then it's on you so then he's able to say most assuredly i say to you he's about to make exclusive statements here whenever you see these i am's it is meaning that I am that person at the exclusion of all others. The believer will look at that and say, absolutely. I totally understand that. And he's going to explain the relationship that he has with the sheep, that they could have that level of assurance. All right. So let's, uh, verses one to five, I just want to go ahead and read them uh, in their, in their, you know, just kind of uninterrupted because here he's giving to them what they will understand Because to this day, you can go into parts of Israel to this day, and this is the way that that people, especially among the Bedouins, this is how their whole lives are. They tend flocks. And in this case, sheep are what's mentioned. So this is imagery that they all know. They all see it. It's around them all the time. So it tells us this. Most assuredly, I say to you, verse 1, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, the sheep uh, hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And he, or, or, or rather, when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, or because they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Great. All right. The believer will hear this and go, totally understand the imagery. They clearly did not. So the picture that is here in their understanding, and it's it's pretty easy to piece together even in our times if we've never even been around a sheepfold. Remember that flocks, the the imagery that is here tells us that there may be more than one group of sheep in a particular pen or in, in a particular sheep fold, because it says that he goes there and he calls his sheep out by name, meaning from among the rest of the sheep. I've actually seen this um, in our times in Israel. You can tell they know the voice, though it may be the same command. They know the voice of the one who always leads them out of the pen and brings them back at the end of the day so that they can go out and graze and do what sheep do during the day. But at the end of it, there's got to be a place that when they when they sleep and when the shepherd has to rest, that they're kept in a safe place. Somebody is going to be watching over that particular, you know, that particular uh, sheep fold where there may be a multitude of flocks. But somebody's going to watch that. However, there's only one way in. Sheep aren't great at jumping, so they're not going to be able to come in 
And then he also uses that same understanding, that thing that keeps the sheep secure is the sheep fold. There's no other way into it unless a door is open or a gate, they come in, it's shut behind them and they're kept securely. Now, if someone wants to come in and take the sheep, the sheep will never voluntarily come to a voice that they don't understand. So if someone's going to come in, they're going to have to climb in or come in some other way. The person that is tending that door and watching and making sure that everything is as it should be, there's a person who is the steward over that particular fold when the shepherd's not around. So they understand the imagery. Jesus is using an imperfect illustration to give to them a perfect one. Because what we do know in the biggest sense of things, it is the Father who, who is watching over the entirety of the sheepfold. However, the one who is the shepherd is Jesus himself. And he's also the only way into that, that fold where the sheep can come in and go out. So he's going to, to explain that in this kind of detail. Now, what we have in verses 6 and the beginning, well, basically 6 is really where it is, is John's commentary after the fact. Again, I love to point this out whenever I can. John is giving us commentary six, 60 years, roughly, after Jesus came and lived and died and resurrected and ascended into heaven. So this is decades later, and John is recounting Jesus's words as he's contending with the Pharisees there in Jerusalem again six decades before So he's going back and he's saying let me give you uh, here's a I'm going to narrate the things that Jesus has said and then he's going to give a quick commentary This is one of those places and it's also instructive for us if a person after 60 years is still So convinced of what it was that he heard that he's passing it along to someone else Let's remember, his life hasn't been easy, especially in the latter years of his life when he's writing this. By the time he writes Revelation, he is basically, he's, he's cast out of society. He's basically um, put in a, an imprisonment on Patmos. So with that being said, he's saying back, as a, as a man who's clearly convinced of the truth and the validity of all this, he says, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. That's commentary. That's him saying, after 60 years, let me explain, they didn't get it. Well, what's important is that Jesus did teach the, the, um, the interpretation of his illustration. They get it. They know what it looks like in the real world. But Jesus is using it as metaphor, which he does with all of the I N statements. Regardless of what Catholics want to say about chapter 6 and him being the bread of life, it was clearly not literal for a number of reasons, and we went through those in chapter 6. But right at the top of them, the two most obvious ones is that Jesus could never give flesh and blood, literally, of a human being to other people because it would be a direct violation of the law. God would never accept it. Leviticus 17 makes that clear. Secondly, it would not be in keeping with the rest of the I am statements. Because in those ones, again, here in chapter 10 or chapter 8, chapter 11, 14, 15, when he says, I am, he's clearly not speaking literal. He's using it as metaphor. So obviously it would be the same in chapter 6, no matter what they say, no matter what anyone wants to say. None of these are literal. If they were literal, he wouldn't need to give interpretation of them, which he does in all of them. So here he gives that interpretation, starts in verse 7. Jesus said to them again, <clears throat> Most assuredly, I say to you that I am the door of the sheep, period. So that said makes him exclusive and no one could ever claim to be the same. And he's about to explain that. But when he says this, I am the, not a, not one of many, I am the, and there is no one else. So it is said at the exclusion of anyone who has ever come. Those are the ones that he addresses. But it would also mean that once he takes that off of the table, no one would ever be able to come and to claim that they are that one who oversees the flock. And we've had them throughout history, even to our modern days, that people claim to be Christ and all the rest of it. They claim to be Jesus and, I mean, just crazy stuff. And yet people still follow them. Well, they wouldn't have the excuse if they understood chapter 10, because Jesus says, I'm going to take this off the table. 
No one else could claim to be this person. This is me. No one from before or ever after would be able to make such a claim. Because the, what they would do is run directly into this and say, well, wait a minute, Jesus said the exact same thing that you're saying now. You can't be him because he is who he is. And again, he did things that these people could never do. So it's pretty simple. Verse 8, <clears throat> all who ever came before me, in, you know, before I showed up, anyone who ever came before me, these are thieves and these are robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now, he doesn't name who they are. We don't know, basically. We, we can put together a, a couple of them by name. Uh, we do remember, I think it's from Acts chapter 5, that's Gamaliel who says it um, about, hey, remember there was that Justice guy and then there was Judas. These were guys who tried to draw people after themselves, but where are they now? So it would appear as though there have been a number of people who were claiming to be that messianic person that has you know claimed to be someone and they've come onto the scene, the people of Israel knew that there was someone who was coming. Their tradition held, based upon the Old Testament, that there would be a, uh, a person who would come along, who would be that, that forever, that Messiah figure. So Jesus says, any of those people who have come before me, they were clearly not him. And it says, but the sheep did not hear them. So that's why none of these people are, are following around some person claiming to be Messiah. All of them had been proven to be a, 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 a fake. All right. So verse 9, he says, so once again, from verse 7, he says it again in verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture. Again, absolute statements. So it's great for us to realize that when it comes to where his sheep gather, Okay, because he's using it again, this metaphor. He says, I have a flock and my flock goes into the sheepfold. However, he says in that imagery, that door that opens and closes, that keeps them in and keeps them secure, I'm that very door. So it won't open on its own. No one else can claim to be that door. He is the only one who can make this statement. So he's able to say, I'm the door of the sheep and they're able to come in and go out because of it. So again, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, so again, chapter 14, he's going to say he is the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except they come through him. Same imagery that's being used here. Now he's using it as sheep. In chapter 14, he becomes a little bit more general. This is very, very specific. So he says this, and it kind of, it, it's an alluding to what he said in verse 8. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it in more abundance. I love it. Life, zoe in Greek. <clears throat> so, this relationship that he has with the sheep. Remember, he says, anybody who's coming to try to take the sheep... They are thieves, robbers. They are looking to destroy and to kill. So by contrast, he is the total antithesis of all of those things. So people that would try to come and to take his people, his sheep, really, remember, he's speaking to the house of Israel here. He's speaking to Jewish people. Anyone who has ever claimed to be who he is really have but one motivation. Whether they realize it or not, they are demonically inspired and it will lead to the death of the flock. So anyone who has ever come claiming to be who he is had but one motivation, and that was to destroy the flock itself. Again, whether they were fully aware of it or not, that would be the end result. And they were thieves, they were robbers. They looked to come into the sheepfold by some other way. There's only one way into the sheepfold, that's through the door. A shepherd would never climb over the railing. Instead, he would say to the person who's tending the door, open that door and he would call to his own sheep. He's going to give that imagery that's here. Now, he says this. This is the second of the I am's. But um, you know what? Before we go on, verse 10 says a really a wonderful thing. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and that they may have it in more abundance or more abundantly. And I still remember it like it was yesterday. I don't even remember. Um, I, I, the one part I don't remember is, is the person who it was. But I remember the event. It was on a Sunday morning. 
coming into church and there's all the pleasantries as you're walking past people good morning hi how are you and all the rest of it but this was one of those where it really stuck it really stood out and as i recall we kind of stopped after that was said or at least i did i paused because i thought well, that's kind of interesting and i had asked a person how's it going and they said i'm getting by interesting i'm getting by Okay, I understand that if maybe there is a particular thing that's happening in their life that's very, very difficult, and it's that getting by, like maybe there's a, a real difficulty in, in life. You know, circumstances around your, your job, your personal health, things in your family. I mean, any number of things like that can put a lot of particular trouble in your life at any, at any time. And a person may be able to say, the things of life are difficult. But if it is the relationship aspect that we have with Jesus, there's never a time when you're just getting by. Things may be difficult, but the relationship with the Lord at all times is good and it's wonderful if we have our eyes focused on him. So this idea that Jesus could say, I give them life and I give it to them in great abundance or more abundantly. So again, there's the physical day-to-day -day of things. I get it. It can be tough day-to-day. -to -day. We understand that. Illness, family things, relationships with people, work, any number of things can make your day-to-day -day of life here in this temporary existence difficult. But I would sincerely hope that every person who calls themselves a believer would never look at their lives in the spiritual sense and say, I'm just getting by. Because if that's the case, what that tells us is the things of life are getting them down spiritually because Jesus says here, it's an absolute statement, I come to give them life and that more abundantly. So again, <clears throat> we are able to see places in the world where people have become believers in Jesus Christ who have incredibly difficult lives. And yet when you look at them, they would be able to, to say, or you would see that they are filled with joy because their, their eternity is a matter that they realize is secure and it's perfect. And they await that time when all the temporary things of this life have vanished and we look at him and things are perfect. Okay, great. So for the believer, in the spiritual sense, we would want to say we live an abundant life spiritually though we may not have two dimes to rub together in the material sense because we're never promised material things we are definitely promised spiritual things and they are abundant so that's why he says what he says here and it is a challenge to every believer don't let the temporary things of this existence affect the abundant life that you have in the spiritual sense that's promised to you by the person of jesus christ great so he says this I am the good shepherd. This is the fourth of his, uh, his I am statements, and they are related. He is the doorway to the sheep, and once that door is open, he is also that shepherd who is good, great, better than all the others. He is the singular good shepherd. There are no others. So he's able to say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's how they recognize who he is. The believer would be able to say, who is Jesus to you? What does he represent to you? We can say so many different things. If we use this, we could say, I am part of his flock. The ones that he loves, we hear. And how do we know that he loves us? Because he gave his life for us, for our benefit. He laid down his life for the well-being of, of the flock of which I am a member. And I come and I go. And he's the one who leads us in and leads us out, but he keeps us in this place of protection, this sheepfold where no one can get at us. Now, it's really a cool thing because, again, the, the, if you have a, a sheepfold where there are a bunch of flocks, he's, he's saying that there is a group of sheep that belong to him. And you could have two, three, four, whatever many flocks could be in a, in a pen but when that shepherd calls them, they react to that shepherd, and the other ones are just going to ignore him. They don't even recognize who he is. They may hear the sound, but they don't recognize him, so they are not brought to attention. Here he says, if we think of the sheepfold as being humanity, when Jesus comes and calls those who know him, their ears perk up, they go to the sound of his voice, and they follow him. That's exactly the picture that's being illustrated here. The believer goes... I understand it entirely. 
I totally get this because we know this. All right, great. Notice what he does by contrast. He's the good shepherd. Now, how do we know that he's good? He's laid down his life for his sheep. He died on a cross, shed his blood to give us life and to give it in greater abundance. The day-to-day -day walk and the understanding of our relationship to him, man, it is everything that we know about day-to-day -day life. Here's a contrast, verse 12. The hireling, he is not the shepherd. One who does not know the sheep, the wolf, um, uh, when he sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care for the sheep. Now, there's a twofold way that this is usually looked at. First of all, Jesus can differentiate himself from the rest of those people who would claim to have been the Christ. Remember, he says, anyone who's ever come, thief and a robber. They, they don't have a love for the sheep. So that's why they do the things that they do. Here he is saying, the person that is the shepherd, now he's using this, the imagery of the shepherd, the ones who have claimed to be a shepherd of the flock, here's how you can test them. Wait until trouble comes, and if they see real danger coming, they themselves will run away, and they don't care because the wolf will just, he doesn't care because the wolf shows up and will devour the sheep, but this person will be able to say, at least I'm not going to be devoured along with the rest of the sheep. Here, Jesus is able to say, yeah, the wolf's coming. Think of it as like the devil, or think of it as sin, or, or whatever, however you want to use it. He's speaking of all of the above. Jesus is the one who gives his life for the sheep. He puts his life on the line and lays it down for the well-being of the sheep. Now again, this looks forward to the time when he will give his life on a cross. It's clear, and that is how a person is saved. Now, at verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. Again, this is what makes the believer tick. It's what makes us different from the rest of the world. People, let's face it, there are 8 billion people on the planet. You could read this verse and this whole chapter to the, the whole of humanity, and a small fraction of the people of, that would hear that would go, I can identify with that. I know who he's talking about. I understand the imagery of this. Some understand it better than others, but the just the rudimentary of it, we get it. When he calls, we answer. Why? Because we know what his voice sounds like. And when he says the things that he says, they resonate with us. Why? Because he's our shepherd. He's laid down his life for us. And the Holy Spirit is the one who ends up, and at the end of it all, why is it that it makes sense to us? Because the, the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to these truths. We have come to an understanding of who he is, our relationship to him, and in his absence, it's the Holy Spirit who says, that's true, that's accurate, that's the one that, that is speaking to you. The good shepherd speaks. We hear him. Okay? So we get the imagery here. So he says, I am the singular good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my sheep. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. He's re reminding them, saying again what he has just said in verse 11. Contrasting him to the hireling, the one who will just, okay, I've been hired for a reason, but I haven't been hired to give my life away. So they just get paid for a job. In this case, Jesus says, I don't get paid for this. I do this because I love the sheep, and I will die for them. Well, we know that he didn't just die, but he resurrected, and he's going to say that. So, as the Father knows me, verse 15, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my flock, for the sheep. Now, verse 16, here's an interesting thing. He says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, and there will be one shepherd. Now, it doesn't really take a great deal of investigation to know exactly what he's talking about. Again, remember who he's talking to. His, his audience is the, the Jewish people. So he's speaking to the house of Israel here. And when he sent out the disciples initially, he said, go to the lost flock of Israel. That was who was being spoken to here. We know that after his death and after his resurrection, then he would send people out and go among the Gentiles. That was going to be done. We see that that took place with Peter in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, and then it really went, went worldwide because of the work of Paul. Now, we know that there were other people clearly that would have been leaving Jerusalem and beginning to take the message of Jesus after his resurrection to the whole world. 
We just have record of some of them. We know that when James talks to those who have been dispersed abroad, okay, that means that the church had to leave from Jerusalem. We get that from Acts chapter 8. There was none left because of the persecution. But that church would go out and they would begin to proselytize. That's why Paul was on his way to Damascus to try to wipe out the church. Now, we know that there would be this work that God would have of, of bringing in the Gentiles. It was prophesied. Let's look at a couple of those examples. The book of Luke, chapter 2. We'll just do a couple of brief examples of it. There are so many that we could point to. But just chapter 2, there's this man named Simeon. God told him, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. They bring Jesus to dedicate him as an infant. Simeon sees him and he says, I can die in peace because God has made good on his promise. That starts at verse 25. But notice what he says in verse 29, as he, as he holds Jesus in his hands and he says this, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Again, verse 29 of Luke chapter 2. You are now letting your servant depart in peace in agreement or in accordance with your word. For, here's why, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the people, a light who will bring revelation to whom? The Gentiles. And glory to your people Israel, two flocks. Now, they're going to be one under him, but as he prophesies of this infant, he's saying the day's going to come, he's going to bring revelation. It's the word in Greek, apocalypsis, exactly the same word that we get for revelation in the book of Revelation, the apocalypsis. Same exact thing. What it means, it's a revealing, it's an opening of the eyes. So in this case, to the Gentiles, he's going to be a revelation to them just as he will be a revelation to the entirety of the world when he comes at his return, when uh, John is speaking about him, and it's an opening of the understanding. Clearly, in John's writing of the book of Revelation, the Apocalypsis, it begins with the things taking place when John writes, but the things that will be happening later on and, and the things that are future to this world. Let's give one look at... Um, at this in also the Old Testament. Turn with me to the book of, um, uh, let's see, um, let's go to the book of Isaiah and let's go to chapter 9. Um, in, uh, in chapter 9, what we get is, uh, in verse 1, this, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed as men who at first, um, at, at first, as when at first he highly esteemed the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And that speaks about where Jesus would be in Nazareth. This is a, a, a prophecy about who Jesus is going to be. To that part of the world. Now, up in the north, there would be a real mixture of not only Jew, but Gentile as well. And this is a prophecy about him from the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily <clears throat> oppressed her. By way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shone. So people would say, well, how do we know that this is speaking about Jesus? Maybe you're reading too much into it. We certainly know geographically it works perfectly, but then notice this in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. This is the context. This child will be known as Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government there will be no end. So speaking prophetically, that it would be to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And by him securing salvation by the forgiveness of sin, anyone who comes to him. Paul would say to Galatians and other places, there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, man, woman, free, slave. He is that Messiah to all who come to him. So with all that understanding, we come back to chapter 10 of John. Jesus says there's another flock that is going to come, and yet 
there is simply another flock at the time, but once he has secured salvation, Jew and Gentile will be one flock, and he will be a shepherd to not only those that were of his his nation, to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles who were not. That is how he is able to be a blessing to the generations. The promise made to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, through you the nations would be blessed, the generations of man, the nations, this is how it happens. Because one is able to reconcile all who come to him, Jew or Gentile, makes no distinction. Verse 17, Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. So you can find places where um, it will say that, that the, the father resurrected him, says it's also done by the power of the Spirit. Here Jesus is able to say, I can give my life away because I can take it back. So who is it? Is it the Father? Is it the Son? Is it the Holy Spirit who resurrected Jesus? It is the power of God who did it. And only people who the only people who could claim to be God in essence would be the Father, Son, and the Spirit, the triune God. He's manifested in three persons. Verse 18, No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself, and I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. This is why I am here, he says. So, even to those people who were his adversaries, <clears throat> even when you take my life, just know that you will have taken my life because I have laid it down, and I will not stay in the grave because I will take it back again. If he couldn't do those things, then his flocks would never have eternal life. They would never have life of any kind. So that's why he is able to say the things that he says. Now here's the end result. Again, we're going to we're going to stop at verse 21. This is again John's commentary after he made these series of absolute statements and they really make him so exclusive that no one else could ever make the same claims. It is a very important thing for us to be able to say this as well. When people will mock us or get angry at us for saying, "Oh, so if I don't believe what you're saying, I need to believe then I'm going to somehow die and I won't see God." Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we're saying. We don't want to back away from that. That's usually said in a way of, of trying to silence the discussion of saying Jesus is the only way. We want to be able to stand on his words. If somebody says, oh, so you're telling me if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to go to hell. Yeah, that's exactly it. Well, who are you to say? I'm nobody. I'm using his words. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Right here he says, he is the door to the sheepfold. And there's no way around it. You either go through him or there is no other way. Anyone who tries to climb in, God will not allow it. It's not acceptable to him because there's no sacrifice made for them. Okay. So it's important for us to be able to say, look, I don't want to make this an argument and make you angry. I'm just telling you that Jesus says he is exclusively and there is no other possible way. We want to be able to go a step further with that and say, heaven is the most exclusive thing, place, whatever you want to call it, that man could ever possibly imagine. And yet, heaven is open to anyone who will come to God on his terms. He's the one who sets the parameters. So we're able to say, no one could ever get in on their own, but no one is excluded from heaven unless they choose to exclude themselves. God makes it open to all men. So with that being said, verse 19, therefore, they, uh, there was much or a great division among the Jews because of what he said. Now you're going to see this division. And how does it break down? Many of them said he has a demon and he is crazy. He's mad. Why do you listen to him? The people on the other side would say this. These are not the words of one who has a demon. Why? Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? They're still going back to this man who has been healed of his blindness. Jesus is giving them all the reasons to believe after the miracle has taken place. The two sides are this. He's crazy. The other side, how do you come up cross with that? I don't care if you think he's crazy, but give us an explanation for how the things that he's doing happen because no one can do those things, especially someone who's demon-possessed. God wouldn't allow it. So, even to this day, we want the same exact way that it can be that black and white. I love black and white. I hate shades of gray. There are none spiritually. Jesus either is or he is not 
if he is the good shepherd and if he is the door to the sheep, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, if he is the light of the world, there is no other way, period. Absolutes. People that want to try to paint in shades of gray, fine, let them do so, but they do not have the biblical authority to do exactly that. They need to come under the command of what the scripture says. So again, their hearts will manifest whether or not they know him by the things that they teach. It's great for us to be able to say, I stand upon the authority of the word of God that is 2,000 years old, so my opinion doesn't matter a bit. Let's just take what the scripture has to say. It is the authority, and upon it we can hold our beliefs. So, we'll get into the second part of chapter um, chapter uh, um, 10, and then it leads us to, at chapter 11, we're going to get to the last time that Jesus comes to and, you know, he's now at the point in chapter 11 that um, he's come to Jerusalem for the last time because it's going to get to chapter 12 of the triumphal entry. In chapter 11, we're going to have another one of his uh, I am statements when he heals Lazarus and brings him back from the dead. So we'll pick that up next week. And I hope that you have, uh, again, this gives us reason to believe why we believe it. And it is hugely important that we understand these things. So the believer needs to stand firmly upon the Word of God. I hope that what we've studied here gives you that. And so if you have any questions about what we've studied, please contact us through the website. There is an email um, that you can click on and send us an email if you have any questions about this. Please let people know about our study through the Gospel of John. If you haven't already done so, most likely you're watching this through uh, YouTube. And on the YouTube channel, there is a way to subscribe to it. Then you'll know whenever we put up content, you'll get an, uh, a, a, um, uh, a notification of it. We love to be able to pass this along. And if you find it useful, please do so. Until next week, I pray that God blesses your uh, study of his word.